Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started. Thank you. My name is Deborah Gonzalez, and I'm the Government Affairs Director here at PPIC, or the Public Policy Institute of California. For those of you who are not familiar with PPIC, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank with offices in Sacramento and San Francisco. Thank you for joining us today, and I particularly want to thank the legislative staff and to say I hope the end of session went well for you. As a former legislative staffer, September's always been my favorite time of year, and I was never sure if it was the fact that we had such nice weather in September or because the members left. So I'm going to say it's the weather. Uh, no offense to the members, but by the, end of by the end of session, you're pretty tired. PPIC recently released a report titled Remedial Education Reforms at California Community Colleges, Early Evidence on Placement and Curricular Reforms. We want to thank the California Acceleration Project and the Sutton Family Fund for this work. We should have, you should have also received a copy of the report on your chair. There are additional copies in the back of the room if you, um, at the registration table. And the refor full report and the slides are online now at ppic.org. We'd also like to thank the PPIC donor circle uh, and the corporate circle for the lovely lunch that we had today, and particularly for the beer bread for some of our new um, staff who are here. For today's program, we're going to hear first from PPI researcher Marisol Cuellar, I'm going to, I always, I'm sorry, Marisol, who will present the main findings from this new report, and then from Jake Jackson, a fellow on, on our Higher Education Center's staff who will moderate a discussion with a fantastic panel who, who had many trials and tribulations to get here. So we're really um, appreciated for the effort you all made to come. And we'll have plenty of time for question and answers from the audience. I want to note that two of our authors are not here. Olga Rodriguez is on maternity leave. And while we miss her, we know that she's having a lot of fun with baby Raphael. And Hans Johnson is sick today. And we really appreciate him not sharing his cold with us. So. But I hope you're watching, Hans. You should have also received an agenda on your chair, and all the speakers' bio, bio, bios are on the back side. So in the interest of time, we'll only do brief introductions today. And please note that we also have an online audience. So when you um, ask a question, please wait for the microphone to come to you. And a couple more things before we begin. Later today, you'll receive a survey. PPIC loves surveys. Um, and so please respond to those surveys. It does help us uh, design these programs uh, to make them more informative for you. And lastly, please turn off your cell phones. Uh, this is, as uh, Marisol reminded me, is the fifth report in a series on developmental education that we've done here at PPIC. And as a former staffer, I'm very excited to know that we continue this work. So often in the legislature, we're able to successfully identify problems and pass bills. We're really good at passing bills. But we don't always do the follow-up research to see if we've identified real solutions to problems. So I want to thank higher education, the Higher Education Center, the funders, and the researchers on this series of projects for the follow-through on this particular topic. We'd also like to thank the Chancellor's Office, but and more importantly, the campuses for working on these projects. Your commitment to improving student outcomes has been very encouraging. I'd now like to introduce Marisol um, Mejia, and she is the Senior Research Associate at PPIC, whose more recent projects have focused on developmental education, the workforce skills gap, online learning in community colleges, and the economic returns to college education. Welcome, Marisol. Well, thank you, Deborah, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, the uh, slides that I'm going the, during the next few minutes, I'm going to present the main findings from our report. Uh, I want to encourage everybody that is here that is interested in this topic to please read the um, report because there is a lot of. Uh, details that I'm not going to go uh, over. And also, please take a look at the technical appendices when we provide very rich information at the college level. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to acknowledge that this research will not have been possible without uh, the student level uh, longitudinal data that was provided by the chancellor's office. So we are very grateful of this partnership. Uh, we also wanted to thank uh, the staff and faculty members at early implemented colleges that took the time to speak with us and help us understand uh, the challenges 
that these implementations uh, will bring and how overcome these challenges. Unfortunately, for interest of time, we are not going to go over uh, that qualitative part of the report. We're going to focus on most, uh, mostly on quantitative results, but again, please go to the report. And finally, I want to also say thanks to our funders because there have been great partners throughout this research. Um, let me start by giving you just a little bit of context of the reform landscape in California community colleges. Uh, with the passage of AB 705, California community colleges are in the midst of a major transformation of developmental education. Uh, AB 705 requires community colleges to maximize the probability that the students will enter and complete transfer level math and English within one year time frame. It also mandates the use of high school records as the primary criteria for placement uh, recommendations. And this is a major change because until uh, recently, colleges uh, have relied uh, mostly on uh, a standardized placement test for making placement decisions. And research has shown that these tests are not as accurate um, in predicting student performance. Um, when AB705 is fully implemented, we expect to see that most colleges are going to um, place the majority of their students in transfer level courses. Uh, this means that uh, curricular uh, reforms are also very important and colleges are being um, encouraged to engage in these types of reforms. Co-requisite remediation is only one way in, uh, or is the most prominent example of these type of reforms. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with the term corrective remediation, it means that uh, under corrective, uh, if a student, uh, a student taking a corrective course is allowed to enroll in a transfer level course, but it also uh, the student is provided but a concurrent is to um, concurrent um, additional support. Uh, also, the Chancellor's Office recently released uh, the full placement rules and guidance for implementation. They provide like a very detailed memo. Uh, for interest of time, I'm not going to go over the details, but also because I think it's important that you hear from the people that actually wrote the memo. So this is something that we are going to talk about during the uh, panel discussion. Uh, finally, um, all community colleges must be in compliance with AB 705 requirements by fall 2019. So really, the clock is ticking, and we don't have that much time. Um, actually, I want to um, say that this is for math and English. The timeline for ESL is different. But for the purposes of this presentation and our report, the focus is only in math and English. However, I want to say that PPC is already working in research um, about ESL. Um, however, I, I want to say that uh, colleges have been engaged in placement and curriculum reform for a long time. I mean, before AB 705 was a reality, colleges were already experimenting with these uh, reforms. However, unfortunately, these reforms never reached the scale and momentum that was needed to really see meaningful and uh, statewide improvements in student outcomes. Uh, so our hope with this report is like the experience um, of early implementer colleges can really shed some light of what colleges can expect to see in terms of student outcomes and also that we can learn from their experience about challenges that they face and how to overcome these challenges. So that was kind of our motivation for this report. Um, just starting with our results, in terms of placement reform, uh, our research found that more than half of colleges have either implemented um, placement reform, um, making high school records the primary criteria for placement decisions or are in the process of doing so. However, in reality, only few colleges have implemented this at scale where we can really see uh, succeed the results. Uh, in terms of requisite remediation, we found that only nine out of 114 colleges were offering uh, corrective English in courses and two colleges offer requisite courses in math by academic year 2016-17, which is the latest uh, year of data that we have available for this research. Um, we also know that in academic year 2017-18, at least uh, seven more colleges are starting offering requisite courses in uh, English. So let me just walk you very quickly about our methodology to identify who are those early implemented colleges. So we use data for this, and then um, we inform those decisions based on data with our interviews. So the first thing that we do, we construct a cohort of students based on the first term in which the student took the English course, in the case of English. 
Then we calculated the share of students who were able to enroll directly in the transfer level course in college composition. The next step is we calculated the change in that share between academic year 2015-16 and academic year 2016-17. And we identified the colleges with the largest increases in that share. Turned out to be that the colleges that we identify were, with very few exceptions, I, I must say, were the colleges that were already using high school records in placement decisions, were the colleges that were implementing corrects, or were the colleges that were doing both things. So, uh, I, I mean, that was, uh, that, that was the things that we also confirm once we have our, well, our interview with, uh, with colleges. Uh, now, in terms of the actual results, we find that 21 uh, colleges actually register increases of more than 10% uh, point, points in the chair of first-time English students enrolled directly into uh, college composition. Out of those 21 colleges, we find that six colleges, um, in, in six colleges, the share of first-time English is um, English going directly into college composition increased by more than 28 percentage points. And this is significantly, if we compare uh, relative to the statewide average, which was only six percentage points. So we are talking about 28 versus six percentage point increase. So that's one of the first message. Uh, then uh, when we look at those uh, six colleges, we find that at least two thirds of first time English students in those colleges started directly in college composition. So in those colleges, the majority of the students were given access to uh, transfer, uh, transfer level English. Um, and this is also when you compare to the state, uh, state um, average, which is only 44%. So we're talking two thirds versus uh, 44%. Um, five of these colleges are using self-reported uh, GPA rules that align with AB705 default uh, placement rules. Two colleges, uh, Skyline and Solano, further broader access to transfer level English by offering corrected courses. Uh, one college, uh, West Hills Coalinga, made all uh, the gains that they experienced in access through corrected remediation. They just now started to uh, implement placement reform, so all the increase was through corrected remediation. Well, in terms of math, as we see, like reform efforts were more common in English than in math. In math, we only uh, were able to identify three colleges, Siskiyou, Cuyamaca, and Los Medanos, with increases um, of 20 percentage points or more in the share of students accessing transfer level math. Uh, in those colleges, between 56 and 67 percent of students started in um, transfer level math courses. Uh, Cuyamaca and Los Medanos are using self-report GPA rules that are actually lower than uh, the default placement uh, rules um, that the chancellors just released. So they are using a cutoff of 2.8 for accessing a pre, uh, um, transfer level statistics versus 3.0. Uh, uh, also, Cuyamaca and Los Medanos uh, offered corrected courses as another way to even increase further uh, access to transfer level courses. Um, Siskiyou is kind of an interesting case for many reasons. Uh, one is that they, the approach was a little bit different than the, the, the like usual correct So what they do is that they increase the number of uh, uh, hours in their transfer statistics course from four hours to six hours. But what they did is they changed um, one lecture unit into a lab unit. And in that lab unit, all the students, regardless of like, if they were deemed unprepared or no, were having uh, access to support, uh, I mean, additional support and tutoring. However, I think this is a very important mention. Uh, access to transfer level courses is not a many, meaningful measure per se. You know, I mean, if you just give a bunch of access, but you don't see report, uh, that if those students are actually not successfully completing the course, you are really not doing anything. So one thing that we did was uh, look at um, the colleges with the biggest increases in access to transfer level English and see what happened with success rates uh, in those college composition courses. And we saw that success rates uh, remained relatively steady. And this information, you can, uh, we have a figure in the appendix where we show that relationship, I mean, that there's not really a relationship between success rates and uh, increases in access. But I, we think that the most important message is what we see in this figure. 
we see a positive and a strong relationship between increases in access and increases in throughput rate. And what is throughput rate? Is the percentage of students in a cohort that complete the college composition course within a year of uh, taking their first uh, course in the subject. So uh, let's say, for example, West Coalinga. West Coalinga was one college that saw big increases both in access and throughput rate, like increases over 40 percentage points. Uh, another thing that I would like to highlight from this figure is that, you know, the majority of the colleges actually didn't see any changes in access or throughput. And that's consistent when we're saying that only few colleges have started to implement these reforms. Um, in the case of math, this figure shows that the relationship is even stronger. But at the same time, we are only talking about like three colleges doing like really uh, or having like a meaningful uh, changes. Uh, but we believe that Siskiyous is like a really a good example. I mean, this is a small college in a rural area. Nobody really was expecting to see these results from them. So it was just very uh, illuminated. And we really wanted to, um, to mention that any college can really do these changes. Uh, in there, they have an increase of 51 percentage uh, points in the share of um, first-time math students enrolling in transfer-level math, and they have an increase of 36 percentage points in their throughput rates. So, I mean, this is just, uh, this is very impressive. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the students that rose to the top in terms of access and throughput rates were colleges that uh, were also offering uh, corrective courses. And I like this figure very much because it tells you, like, um, we are comparing here throughput rates of students enrolling corrective throughput rates of students in um, one semester, um, one semester um, English, uh, developmental English, and the traditional rem remediation. And what we see is across colleges, uh, the throughput rates of uh, students enrolled in corrective cor courses are significantly higher. I mean, uh, overall, we found that across like the, the nine colleges, 78% of students completed the college level course. So this is something that uh, we, didn't, we don't see with uh, one semester acceleration and, and tradition, and not with the, of course, not with the traditional remediation. And uh, we were thinking about, I mean, the last report we did, we did a focus in one semester acceleration, and we were saying like how that was like a good, I mean, we were seeing like very good results relative to uh, the traditional sequence. But you know, when you see this, the, those numbers is like before even were better than the traditional remediation is still less than half of students were completing the courses. Uh, so we believe that this is a very powerful um, graph. And another thing that we want to mention is, I don't know if it's expected, but we see also variation across colleges. And I think that's not surprising because uh, Colleges are implementing corrective in different ways. So, so there are different ways in which college can approach corrective. Also, they have different um, criteria for accessing the course, and also they have different students' populations. So it's not really surprising that we see that variation. But again, everybody is experiencing experiment, uh, big increases. Um, the, I mean, the same story in terms of math. We only have two colleges with our Cuyamac and Los Medanos, but also what's interesting because those two colleges were also offering uh, one semester pre stat courses. And then we see, I mean, again, it is just a very big uh, difference between throughput rates between pre stats or traditional and the correct seat. Um, I don't know, just to give you just like a little bit of an idea of the magnitude. Uh, here in English, we were talking about uh, 3,000 students enrolling correct seats in during academic year 2016-17. Uh, um, Here we're talking about 1,200 students enrolling correct seat courses. Um, but yeah, let me. Uh, before I end my presentation, I would really like to do a few remarks about <laughs> equity. Uh, we know that. Um, Equity consideration was really a motivating factor behind all these reform efforts. Uh, students of color, underrepresented students, really were um, overrepresented in the students and the, in the group of students placed into remediation. So uh, I think what we want to know, what we want to tell colleges is like as they move forward uh, with uh, making changes toward compliance with AB 705 uh, uh, requirements, they should be intentional about the student success and narrowing uh, equity gaps. That should, should, should be something that is in, on top of their agendas. What we see in math is that at early implementers, 
colleges have seen a huge increase in the share of students of color giving access to transfer level courses. And I guess this, I mean, this is just the result of, of what the policy is, is just giving access to everybody. But we see that um, uh, in terms of both access and throughput rate, we have seen that uh, implement, uh, early implementers have uh, rates that are twice as big as the uh, state average. Uh, in terms of, so of equity gaps, the equity gaps that we are seeing in math are, uh, are definitely have narrow. We, uh, for example, in terms of throughput rates, the white and Latino uh, achievement gap in early implementers is six percentage points versus 16 in the, uh, uh, the average for uh, all other colleges. Um, improvements, improvements in college level composition, access and throughput rates for students of color in, uh, in English has been less dramatic, but it's still like uh, not worthy. Uh, however, we haven't really seen yet, uh, on average, like a big reduction on equity gaps. So that's something that we definitely will continue to monitor. Um, just a couple of quick remarks before we move on to our panel discussion. I think that uh, those are just two very important uh, topics that we believe. Uh, one is accountability, monitoring, and evaluation are going to be key. That means uh, data collection is going to be crucial. And uh, we're hoping that already the chancellor's office, the colleges are working in um, just establishing what are they going to be the mechanisms and the process for making these uh, uh, accountable, accountability monitoring and evaluation. Um, finally, also, because that's what we do, we believe that rigorous research will continue to play a critical role. And that means uh, we need to really um, continue study uh, what happened once we add more students in our sample of, correct, of colleges of a correct seat. Are we going to be continue to see like all colleges are having the same gains? Also, are, are we going to be important to determine what kind of concurrent support work better than others? It's going to be important to identify uh, students that are not being successful under these reforms and just like um, change and try to improve um, uh, their outcomes and also um, very important is to assess and identify the longer term uh, effects of these reforms. So we want to see if students enroll in correct uh, courses, how they do in the other courses that they take, transfer level courses, are they ha uh, they're succeeding at the same rate as, as other students. We also want to see if those students are more likely to uh, transfer to a 4G institution. <laughs> and also finally, I think research is important to identify any unintended uh, consequences that this policy may have. Um, so with this, I uh, end my presentation. Um, I can take a couple of clarifying questions uh, before our panel, yes. I don't know if you wanna wait for the microphone. Yes, you mentioned that you would follow up with students and see their success in their other classes and upon transfer. I'm in the math department and I have colleagues who are concerned not just about that, but in how the workforce will react to students who are less prepared in algebra. Would you please follow up on that also? Okay, definitely. I mean, that's something that is in our uh, research agenda definitely for the coming years. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, I imagine that uh, part of the future research should include um, looking at how is this reform uh, going to be to impact what happens in the classroom and how are we going to prepare the instructors, the faculty, to maybe make some changes, maybe cultural relevant teaching, whatever they need to help students be successful. So I, I'm hoping that definitely will be a piece of your right. future research. Well, you know, definitely, as I mentioned at the beginning, we all were only going to focus on our quantitative results, but from our interviews with early implementer colleges, we have a set of like themes that emerge from those interviews and uh, in terms of challenges and opportunities. So we, we for sure we have uh, professional development, we have uh, the importance of um, things like uh, equity mind practices and all the things that they mentioned. So you find uh, some of those things in the report. Thank you. So with this, I would like to um, uh, um, welcome my colleague, Jacob Jackson, to come to stage and also to our prestigious uh, group of panelists. And I'm really looking forward to what is said to be a very engaged discussion. Thank you.
So thank you to Marisol uh, for an excellent presentation. Uh, and thanks to all of you in the audience for coming today. Uh, my name is Jacob Jackson. I'm a research fellow at the Higher Ed Center here at PPIC. Um, I'm filling in today for Hans Johnson, who couldn't be here. So if you came exclusively to watch Hans Johnson moderate a panel, I'm terribly sorry. Um, so we have a great panel today uh, to discuss placement and curricular reform at the community colleges. Uh, and I'm excited to get started. Um, first, I want to extend my thanks to this wonderful panel and also provide some brief introductions. Uh, all three have a unique perspective on placement and curricular reform from where they sit at the California Community Colleges. Uh, their full bios are in the program on the back, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll keep these intros pretty brief. Uh, so far to your left uh, is Rowanna B. Benny. She's the interim president of Las Positas College in Livermore, California. Uh, next to her is Katie Hearn, an English instructor at Chabot College in Hayward, and a co-founder of the California Acceleration Project, which I'm sure we'll hear more about today. Uh, and then right next to me is Laura Mattoon. Uh, thank you for being here. She is the Vice Chancellor of External Relations for the California Community College Chancellor's Office. Uh, so thanks all for coming here today and discussing this important and fun topic. Um, I've got some questions to ask you, um, and then we'll leave some time at the end for audience questions. Uh, before we get started, I do want to reiterate that this is uh, just the recent in, in a, a string of reports we've done on, on this important topic. But just in case you're concerned, no, this is not our last one. Uh, we have several more in, in the hopper we're working on. Uh, things are changing fast there uh, at community colleges, especially around this um, uh, placement reform and curricular reform. Uh, so we'll keep doing uh, due diligence on that. So uh, first, I have an addendum to our slideshow. Um, I'm going to. A click here. Um, I'd like to start off by asking Aunt Laura to talk about a memo that the Chancellor's Office recently released that lays out some implementation guidelines. And afterward, um, I'd like uh, Katie and President Benny to respond uh, on, on these. Uh, so I've got this, and we'll just oh, click through if you want. Sure. So I just I wanted to start by just recognizing. Um, the huge number of people in this room that had such an important role in the passage of AB 705 and the support of our Board of Governors in its implementation. And I wanted to recognize Board Member Monfon, who's sitting in the back. Thank you for being here. I'll start just by saying the development of these default placement rules came about through the work of Executive Vice Chancellor Laura Hope, who brought together an implementation committee that included the Academic Senate as a key partner as well as voices from research, from the Acceleration Project, from college administrators, um, and then two of our board members also participated in that process. The first thing they did was agree to a general timeline around implementation that focuses on that fall of 2019 implementation deadline. And then they heard from a series of researchers in terms of all of the work that's already been happening across our colleges and what the outcomes have been associated with those changes. Primarily, we relied on research from the Multiple Measures Assessment Project, as well as the RP Group. And so these default placement rules were developed and released in a 10-page memo on July 11th. The memo was co-signed by the Vice Chancellor Hope, as well as uh, the chair of our Academic Senate. So essentially, as was discussed earlier, there are two primary rules that govern the process. Um, Essentially, colleges are prohibited from placing students into pre-transfer courses in math and English unless both of the following requirements are met. First, that the student is highly unlikely to succeed in transfer level coursework. And second, that enrollment in pre-transfer coursework will improve the student's likelihood of completing transfer level within one year. So based on those two rules, these default placement guidelines were established. So the first slide you're looking at here is related to English. So essentially, the research that was conducted between 2007 and 2014 showed that students with a GPA of higher than 2.6 had a 78.6% chance of being successful in transfer level English with no support. So the Chancellor's Office is recommending that colleges put students in that category directly into transfer level English. In the second band, the research showed that students with a GPA between 1.9 and 2.6 had a 57.7% chance of being successful. So we're recommending that those students also be placed into transfer level with support being optional. And then for the students in that third band there below a GPA of 1.9, their success rates are looking at 42.6%. And we're recommending those students also be put directly into transfer level with a co-requisite or other support to ensure their success. 
These next couple of slides, I won't walk through all the numbers because um, you could look at them um, in our memo, but that same formula follows. Essentially, we've created rules here for what is the same? B STEM. Statistics. Okay. That's statistics. So business and STEM. Oh, no, this is statistics. Oh, I apologize. So for students who are, have a um, liberal arts pathway that they're looking at, we're essentially recommending a set of rules um, that follows this. Um, here it is. Uh, this chart here, students with a GPA of greater than 3.0, 75% chance of being successful directly into transfer level. We're not encouraging support for that category. They should go directly into the transfer course. In those two bands below, um, the support might be provided. In the lowest band, the support um, should be provided. And similarly for the following slide here, this is for students who are in a B-STEM pathway. Um, so if their GPA is 3.4 or greater, or if their GPA is 2.6 or greater and they were enrolled in high school calculus, they should go directly into that B-STEM math course without additional support. If they're in these lower two bands, um, additional support is necessary for the students. I just wanted to add a couple of additional points on there. One is that this, these um, guidelines are for students who have graduated within 10 years of high school. Um, and then local rules can be developed by the college, but they must adhere to those same uh, guidelines outlined in the statute. The chancellor's office is in the process of putting together a validation um, scheme that colleges will be able to use. Um, and then just finally, I wanted to say in those lowest bands, colleges, our guidance to colleges that about recommending that they provide co-requisite support was exactly that guidance to colleges. Colleges can and probably should choose to require students to take that co-requisite support. Uh, to ensure their success. No, I just, I just ended oh. it. Oh, I brought it back. Uh, the first uh, condition of the second Oh, the greater than or equal to 2.6? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a typo. <laughs> Always glad to have math faculty in the audience. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, Katie and President Benny, um, I, I just want to get your reaction to these. What do these guidelines mean for you and your institutions? And then are you left with any questions, any lingering questions there? And if you don't have any, I probably do. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about how we got to implementing ahead of the, of the actual bill. And that is, <clears throat> we had um, uh, Dr. Hess, John Hess come and he had um, talked with some of our faculty, our English faculty, even prior to him coming to the campus. So by the time he came to campus and they were gathering information, he had um, all of our little, all of our English group reasoned risk takers and we were, were ready to jump right in and launch into that. They had one main question is that is, how can we, um, we because we're not getting consistent data from CalPASS, how are we going to manage that piece? So our researcher did a extensive work on, we had been collecting um, uh, GPAs in ranges for, for several years and our incoming students. So he took that and mapped that and showed how that self-reporting, because they had been self-reporting those, they, they, it matched exactly. So when that barrier was removed, then we launched right into the work. And Katie, what about you? Are left with any questions from, from these, or uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts? Um, just on, on the default placement rules, um, I, my project, California Acceleration Project, supports faculty from colleges across the state to sort of develop responses to this and, and supported the early implementers to, mm -hmm. to do the early reforms. Um, and I think that some of the things that are coming up in the field is um, there was confusion about whether the language of recommended or require, you know, so there was confusion among some colleges about whether they could require concurrent support. And the answer that's come out of the chancellor's office, the clarification is very helpful, is that yes, we absolutely can, that the use of the word recommended was a recommendation to the colleges about what the colleges could locally decide to do. Um, and then I think that sometimes people, um, look at the lowest bands and say, 29% success rate for that lowest group. This is an outrage. You know, and I, and I think that the important context that in the AB705 implementation we looked at is, but how would those students do if they started in a remedial course below? 
and that, that the first memo that came out from the chancellor's office actually mapped that. So in, in English, 2.6 and above, if they went directly to college English, it was 80% would pass it. But if they started one level below, that group had a 40% completion rate in one year. And even the lowest group, the 43% pass rate, that we, we certainly want concurrent support to help them be more successful. If you look at, if you put them into a one level below course, they would have about a 12% throughput. So that, that's the sort of the logic, that's sort of the game changer of AB705 for the field. That in the past, we've just, we've decided, do you get into college level? You only get there if you're highly likely to succeed. You have to really go through some hoops. And AB705 is making, us as a field shift to that the student's placement should not leave them worse off, <laughs> which it has been <laughs> historically. So, so that the placement needs to make them have a higher, that, that group have a higher completion rate. And the lowest group with the lowest GPA, there's a lot of stuff going on that leads to a 1.9 or below GPA in high school. It might be housing insecurity, it might be substance abuse, it might be genuine academic difficulties. We don't, there's a lot going on there. So that group is probably gonna continue to have issues in college. But we shouldn't put them into a structure that we know makes them worse off. That, that, and that's the, that's the sort of the game changer for the field that is, that we're, we're sort of moving from one paradigm of placement to another. And that's, it's a really big disruptive shift. And that was the um, data that began to shift for the math. Because as they begin to, as they've done their study at Las Positas, if you start in pre-algebra, do elementary, then intermediate, then and then do transfer math, the throughput on that is 8%. Yeah. But if you just start one level higher, if you start at elementary, it's already 22%. So it's the data that's been really influencing our campus to take measures. And I think the first measures, the access measures, are a little bit easier. So we're wrestling now with the co-requisite, more units. We're <coughs> wrestling with the other um, support pieces that are, are more difficult. We, we do want to get into that uh, later, too. Um, but one of the things that, uh, I, I love research, I'm a researcher, uh, but one of the, the, the things that leaves us hanging with research is oftentimes when we start a project and finish it, we're you, by the end of it, we're using data from 2017. Right. Uh, and this is a fast-moving train. And I'd like to figure out what's happened since then, especially since um, AB705 has passed and, and has a deadline. Um, so President Benny, from, uh, from you, you've made extensive progress toward AB705 compliance. Uh, between now and fall 2019, what other changes are you planning on implementing? And uh, uh, specifically, what about math? Well, yeah, I, I actually can't answer that fully because they're still hosting. Um, I don't know if they're hosting groups, work groups on your campus as well, but they are on, on ours and they're trying to really look and decide together. And that's a difficult process when you're talking about um, large groups of faculty and then when you're actually looking at the implications across the campus and as others are beginning to realize the implications, especially with the um, the AccuPlacer, the placement test not being available um, starting in the fall, that also has in, has influenced them to um, take steps forward. So we're we're wrestling with the the next steps. So we've made initial implementation in both math and English, and um, we're working right now on all of that. And Katie, from your interaction with colleges and your own, uh, how would you qualify the progress made so far? Uh, I would say it's really mixed across 114 colleges. So you have some colleges that that were already moving in this direction, and AB705 just gave them the push to go full scale. Like, it just came up, Alan Hancock, we have a Facebook group, the California Acceleration Project, and Alan Hancock faculty posted last night that their department had voted to get rid of all developmental courses below transfer level starting in the spring, when a semester ahead of the deadline. And they only are transfer level and transfer level with concurrent support. Um, and that is a college that had had you know, pilots of successful accelerated models, but they are members of the department that wanted to hang on to their four levels below. So they were continuing to offer four levels of remedial English while they were offering these much more successful models. Uh, and the department was sort of like, and, that, and I saw that, I've seen that happen across the state, that there are faculty who want to move in this direction, but I think there's a sort of, a, the, the inertia of the status quo is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for some colleges, it's tipping them into full scale, all in. And then other colleges are looking for loopholes. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and are wanting to be in the gray area of like, well, what if they don't have a transfer intention? Or it says one year. Are we okay as long as we like take these two courses and cram them together, and then these two courses and cram them together? And we can still offer four classes inside one year. Is that compliant? And we're saying no, <laughs> no, no, it isn't because the law gives students rights to the to the placement that gives them the best possible chance of completion. And we already know from existing data that that will not do it. So, so there's a sort of a, the, the, and then there's some colleges that have literally said, well, what are they, are they going to really enforce this? Let's, what are they going to do to us? <laughs> you know? um, and so I think we're going to see um, in fall 19, the one thing I'll say is it's going to be really clear who is doing what, because we all report our MIS data every semester. What, what classes are we offering? Where are students enrolling? And so some of these colleges are going to continue to pull out ahead of the rest of the pack because they've, they've really embraced these changes. And others, we're going to see really low completion rates. And we're going to see a lot of students still enrolling in below transfer level courses. Um, and then I think the question is, what are they going to do to us? <laughs> like, I don't know. What, I think we're really figuring that out. But I, it's, um, I, I do think that one of the most um, some colleges are saying, well, we'll make it available to everybody, but we're going to continue to still have a lot of <laughs> section offerings. And they're using the language of option. We want to give students the option of enrolling in a course that makes them radically less likely to complete college. We want to give them an option, <laughs> you know? Um, or using guided placement. Like, well, we're not requiring it, but we are scaring you so much through the assessment process that you're going to choose it. Um, or this idea of the one year, you know, the sort of misinterpretation of the law that all it requires is a one year pathway and then we're done. Um, so I think that, that that's a lot of the challenge of this moment when curriculum needs to get in right now. Like this is the moment where we have to build our concurrent support and get our new placement policies in place. And I think we're gonna continue to see really uneven uh, embracing so, of these changes. So Katie has, has already brought up uh, the next topic, which is challenges to implementation. And I'm sure all three of you have uh, unique perspectives on what on what challenges might be. Um, so drawing from your experiences, uh, well, for, in our uh, interviews, uh, which um, we, we interviewed a lot of people for this, um, and it may have not appeared in the paper. There's not room for everything we've ever done in the paper. Uh, but we heard uh, early implementers said things like technical issues, resistance to change, and scheduling as some of the challenges faced. Uh, and you're, you're shaking your heads, yes. Uh, but, but in addition, uh, are, are there more? Or, or can you describe those maybe in, in further detail? And Laura, I'm sure that um, stuff bubbles up to you uh, uh, quite often. And you want to start us off? Sure, sure. Um, you know, uh, last year I had the opportunity to visit two of our colleges that are doing uh, some great work in this, um, San Diego Mesa and Cuyamaca. And at both of those colleges, what was clear to me is that the leadership of the faculty and um, the opportunities that, that they had for their own professional development were what made their um, efforts so successful and really take hold at those colleges. And so I think that one of the things we're going to have to consider as a state and at the Board of Governors level and in the Chancellor's Office is what kind of ongoing funding can we provide to colleges to provide that kind of professional development to both their faculty as well as their classified staff, their assessment officers. Everybody really needs to understand what are these changes that we're asking for, what is the research behind them, and then what is their individual roles in helping them be successful. Um, so that, that I think is probably one of the most important things. So Laura, that, thank you for the opportunity to um, tune right into that theme because I think that as Las Positas is one of the colleges that in the new funding formula is, um, is most hurt by the new funding formula. So that means our um, income to our district will shrink significantly. It's, it's flat this year, but it will be down and then down and then significantly down, millions of dollars in our district. So what we're really trying to wrestle with is um, because those uh, companion courses or co-requisite courses, if you add them to a student's schedule, then you're also adding them as a cost and we can't bear any new, any new costs. So that to us is, uh, is huge um, because we see that what could likely happen is that we will have this uh, glut of students, which we love having all those students, but that won't be able to get their sections because if you just do the numbers, you can see how easily those two units or that one unit adds up to over hundreds of students. 
and um, our ability to address that need will, we, we don't have the ability. So we will have to limit. We, we will have better throughput, so we will have a much better percentage of students that make it through, but we will have a far smaller number who have access because of um, limited sections. So it's significant to us. Yeah, I, I don't want to turn it into a debate on the funding formula, but I do want to say, yes. <laughs> you know, one of the concerns that colleges raised to us during the debate around the funding formula is that traditionally they've been funded based on the number of students that enroll in courses. And it is incentivized placing students into remedial courses. And in fact, I've been at colleges where I've been asked, what are we going to do to meet our FTE targets if we reduce all of these remedial courses? And so, you know, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, and we probably could look more deeply at what's happening at your college. But one of the things the funding formula tried to do was incentivize colleges to provide access to low-income students and to get those low-income students to completion. And we also incentivized, um, because of the work of uh, Christian Osmania, who's sitting right over here, and Chancellor Oakley, um, the number of students that you get through transfer level math and English within one year. And so in the funding formula, an additional amount of money is provided for students who get through transfer level math and English in one year, and an even additional amount for low income students who achieve that goal. So I, I do think the funding formula was intended to incentivize the types of reforms we're talking about here. But there will be an implementation oversight committee and lots of additional opportunity for us to debate its actual implications locally. Okay. And Katie, uh, maybe this is a good time to talk about resources that are available to colleges as they try to implement. And I know you've recently released a toolkit. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the California Acceleration Project website, uh, accelerationproject.org, we have a toolkit that has, um, we've, we've compiled information on all the co-requisite models around the state in English and math, for example, or some national exemplars. We have um, checklist, implementation checklists and what recommends, you know, what do we recommend that's going to produce the greatest gains in completion and equity? So, and then we have a series of one-day events um, this fall. The first one is next Friday at, at, near LAX, and then the 28th of September in Emeryville. Uh, and then another one, another set in November. So, so we're just trying to work with colleges. The first, first ones around building concurrent support, getting getting the structures in place for next year, and then and then as we move through the year, we're going to move more toward the the classroom because I think there are a lot of changes we're going to need to make in the classroom that I, we've been those of us who teach college transfer level English or math, we've gotten used to seeing an incredibly filtered population. Because it was only like the, the top, you know, at some colleges, less than 10% of students would get into transfer level math. So it was the, either the survivors of the gauntlet of remediation or the very highest scoring students. And so I think in our mind, that's what college ready looks like. But that's actually like upper division, what we've been, you know, that's somebody who's probably been at the college for two years or that very, you know, so college ready is a student who can actually take this class and benefit from it. But that's a messier looking group, I think. You know, like it's gonna be a little rougher around the edges and gonna need more guidance about how to do college, gonna need more um, supportive classroom environments, gonna need faculty who understand that these are incoming students who need to learn, who need us to apprentice them to this world. Um, and I think that we need to professional development as a field to make that shift from the expectation of like, you need to be ready for me, otherwise you don't belong here to welcome, let me help you. Yes, we've been very grateful for both professional development and the toolkit. It has helped us have our discussion, have full discussion, really, um, and professional development as we've been involved in all different kinds of professional development. One of the other big topics that I just would like to mention, because as a president, I think I'm trying to look at it more globally, like the funding formula, and that is the variety of ways that colleges will approach this across the state and even in a region where students might be moving from one college to another. That's of concern to us because they will get um, mixed messages and trying to sort of bring some standardization and bring some language that could help would um, would be is going to be necessary. That's great. Actually, that leads right into the next question. I want to get one more in before we have audience questions, and it, it's about accountability and enforcement, which was mentioned briefly. Uh, so we learned quite a bit today uh, about what's going on, uh, but there is a time limit on, on this uh, fall 2019, which is I mean rapidly approaching. 
Um, I'm wondering about accountability enforcement and monitoring. Um, so President Benny, you spoke a little bit uh, about it already, but how are you measuring progress at your college? Uh, what metrics are you using? Well, we have actually had discussions at every level, and so we are, we are actually trying to work backwards from next fall, from fall of 19, and talk about what needs to be done by March when our students are, um, are going to be registering and how are we going to get out information to them and how are we going to actually really actually help our students over this hurdle. It's not just about us, it's all about them. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's actually um, what we're, we're really trying to do some work around. Great. And then, uh, I mean, I guess in, in the end, one of the questions is, so what are you going to do when not everybody makes it? Uh, and so, I mean, I'm going to direct it toward Laura, but Katie, if you know as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Do you mean I, the I colleges when the colleges? I meant the colleges. Oh, I'm sorry. Fall yes. 19 comes. <laughs> I, that's what I meant. Yeah. People are still doing what they've been doing. At a very basic level, the colleges put at risk their funding that they received under AB 19, the California College Promise Program. There's a requirement in that law that says that colleges have to comply with assessment and placement policies. Um, this year, the legislature gave us $46 million in that budget line item. There, it certainly could grow. Um, and so if a college is not compliant, they would risk losing access to that money. They're also at risk of losing access to their Guided Pathways funding. Um, you know, and I think what we've seen from the legislature on this issue is a real intent to ensure follow through that we do comply. And so those are the tool tools in the chancellor's office tool belt currently. Uh, if we see a, a lot, an increased number of students being enrolled in remedial, you know, I mean, obviously we should see a huge number more of students going into transfer level courses and being successful at that level. And if that's not what we're seeing, I think I would expect the legislature to look at what additional tools might be necessary. Yeah, I've, I've sort of thought you know, it, based on the research, that there, we have yet to identify a single group of students that has higher completion if they begin below transfer level. So this sort of gives us a bottom line clarity here. So, so then we get limited resources from the state. What, what should our course schedule, what should be in our course schedule? What should we be offering? How many, what percentage of classes should be below transfer level if not a single group of students can be identified who benefits from that placement? Zero. Zero. I mean, I, I think we could, we could talk about some very narrow exceptions, like if you're in a CTE certificate program and it's a math for diesel mechanics. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. But really, in English, there's not a single group of students, even students with disabilities, like the, the groups that we worry about, Students who aren't native speakers, they, they, the data show they all do better in these models. So I really think that, that part of compliance is going to need to be kind of all eyes on course schedules for fall 19. You know, and that's public. That's, and then there's also the Chancellor's Office MIS data. But you could just look at any, any college and look at their course offerings and how many are below transfer level. And I want to point out in the PPIC, if you go to the technical appendix, which is juicy reading, because it's like 114 colleges, what percentage of students start in transfer level? What percentage of students complete transfer level within a year, math and English, for all 114 colleges? We put together a slide of like the worst perform, the lowest 10 for an event we gave recently, <laughs> and everyone in the room was like, <laughs> like, oh, we hope we're not on there. One college was on there, and they were like, but we, had, we fixed it in 2017, and you're looking at 2016. So I, I think that when, when I look at that, this, the colleges that have the highest proportions of black and Latino students have the lowest percentage of students beginning in transfer level courses, and therefore the lowest completion of those courses. And so it's like the lowest in math is, I think math and English possibly is LA Southwest which has more than 90% of students are black or, or Hispanic. Compton is another one at the bottom. So, so I just think like this is, this is where the equity issue is. It's like these structures, we know these structures don't serve students. And some students have access to structures in which they're much more likely to be successful and other students do not. And that's what we need to have our eye on in monitoring in fall 2019. And if there's a lot of sort of status quo continuation of this, then, I, you know, it's irresponsible. It's irresponsible what we've been doing. So I'd love to sit and ask questions myself all day, but uh, I have to turn it over to the audience. So I'm going to open up for questions. Um, I have a couple, couple ground rules. Uh, first, please wait for the microphone. Uh, we are webcasting. Uh, the camera's over there. You don't have to look at the camera. It's just over there. Um, 
Uh, for those who are not fortunate enough to join us on a Friday afternoon uh, here in Sacramento at 95 degrees. Uh, and then so we can have as much participation as possible, please keep your questions brief and also make them questions. <laughs> um, so I'm going to call on uh, people with microphones and, and feel free to ask questions of the panel here. Marisol is also available to answer questions afterward. Uh, but if you, if you have a burning question for Marisol now, uh, who, who did the research, you can ask her then. My question is regarding the people that don't make it in that one year time frame. Um, so they've apparently, in theory, attempted the transfer level twice. They can only take the support class once. Are we, as a state, saying you get a one-year shot and then college is just not for you? What are we going to be allowed to do to help that population of students? I was only in math, 28% of students making it in one year. That's 72% from that bracket that's not making it. Um, so what are we going to be allowed to do with that? Are they going to be allowed to access financial aid while they're doing that? I don't know who's best. I, I think that the, um, you know, I hear that question a lot, and I think that the truth is we're failing these students now, and we're failing many more of them under our current structures. And so this change is going to provide so many more students the opportunity to be successful. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, Absolutely not are we saying that a student who fails twice shouldn't have access to a pathway. I think part of the work we're doing in the guided pathways work is to help students identify where, what pathways they should be on and where they'll be successful and to provide them the supports to get there. And I'm glad you brought up financial aid because next year our, our office will be working really hard to try and equalize financial aid across community colleges. Right now we serve two thirds of the student body student undergraduates and we get only 7% of Cal Grant dollars, there needs to be a significant investment in financial aid structures and it needs to come to community college students. Right Can I also speak to that, that the 28% the figure that you're citing, that was in a regular class with no support. So when you look at co-requisite models with, that are serving 100%, or like Siskiyou just, just made the four unit class six hours. That's all they did and they let 100% of their students into college statistics. And the pass rate was, very high. Over 67. 60, thank you. 67%. And, and then the co rec models at Cuyamaca and Los, uh, Los Madanos, Cuyamaca lets 100% of students into stats with co rec support, and the pass rate is 72%. So, so I just want to be clear that they don't, don't fixate on the lowest band and that that, is a, that number is low because. Well, no, I know. Yes, exactly. But the problem is math people haven't really been developing COREXs. And, but if you look at other states where they have moved to COREX across the board, you see enormous increases in completion of college level math. So Tennessee is one example that completion of college level math quadrupled across Tennessee when they went from prerequisite remediation to co-requisite remediation statewide. And for students of color, it was seven times higher. So achievement gaps were shrinking pretty dramatically. And the, uh, okay, I just lost my train of thought because I was trying to listen to that little comment being made over there. <laughs> um, the other thing about Tennessee is that they started to dig into who doesn't pass co-requisite models. So that's, that's a weird part of the concern I hear you coming from as a teacher is like, what about the, are we going to lose any students? Are there going to be students who fall through the cracks in this model? And when they've been looking at that, they found that the students who don't pass co-requisite models, most of them don't pass any class they take. So I think that helps us to get, there needs to be a lot more study of that population. But one thing that it says to me is, it's probably not their fractions. It's probably not the ability to factor polynomial, or their, they have fused sentences in English or whatever. It's, it, they're not doing college. Why aren't they? Is it a basic needs issue? Is it that they, they have insecure food, insecure housing? Is it that they're smoking a bong in their dorm room all semester? I, like, I don't know, but I know that it's a, we need a more nuanced answer than they needed a, another level of math, you know, if they're not passing anything. And I think that's the work of the next three years, just to sort of, now that we've, we, we, I've been doing this work in acceleration for like 10 years. The debate up until now has been whether to make these changes. That debate is over. The legislature settled that one. <laughs> now we have to make these changes. Now we get to really study how to do it as effectively as possible. That's, that's what the new question is going to be. And, and that's what I, that I think we'll dig into that in three years. We'll have a better answer to your question. 
Hi, so uh, I think you've just touched on one of these items in terms of what can the legislature and policymakers do going into next year to really continue the momentum here and support those early adopters. You know, I think clearly financial aid and helping those students address the non-academic barriers that they might face sounds like one of those. And I'm wondering what else, and I know another idea was the ongoing funding stream. Um, what else can the legislature do with existing funding, um, with, with data that would really support the work for, for presidents and for faculty um, so that our, our legislative partners that are here in the room today can maybe take those ideas back to their bosses across the street. I have to say right out of the gate, professional development and support for our, our IR offices. That was a little hard to say. Um, because the, well, at least on our campus, we're influenced by what we understand about our students. And so our IR office needs um, the space and the time to be able to work on some of that. And professional development is very significant in, um, in working with faculty to address all the needs in the classroom, especially the underrepresented students. And I think part of the um, success of institutional research is dependent on access to data. But so our state doesn't currently have a longitudinal data system. The chancellor's office, people that worked on this long before I got here, have really developed a strong system of data for within the community colleges. But we have a really hard time getting data across our segments. Right now we're trying to negotiate an MOU with the Department of Education yes. Yes. that would allow us to get system level access to course and grade data. Um, you know, those individual MOUs can be successful, but it's just a really Really long arduous process it involves a lot of attorneys that we'd like to avoid if we could have the state invest in a system that covered you know k-12 through workforce mm -hmm. I want to begin by saying thank you to President Benny for asking for professional development we really need that and right now it's only going to those of us who are enthusiastic about this I'd love to see it go toward everyone in our department Okay, so here's my question. What do we do about the barriers we're hearing from our faculty leaders on campus uh, when they pull out, well, this part of Title V says you can't do that, or this part of Title V says you can't do that. The example we are looking at is we are looking at um, whether a student who fails the first time with the co-requisite should be allowed to take that co-requisite next time. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to say the grade should be tied together so that the student kind of moves along with that. We don't have repeatability for the co-requisite because of co-requisite rules. And we're being told we can't tie the grade together. So a student could pass that co-requisite and then not get to take a co-requisite on their second try through that course. So that, you know, what can you do to help us? I'm really glad that you brought that up. This is actually one of the things that Chancellor Oakley started to focus on when he first came into to the chancellor's office was asking, he asked all of the CEOs for to name those regulations that really stand in the way of student success. And we got a number of responses back to our office. Some of them were statutory based, some of them are just in reg. We have a team internally right now that's going through the regulations to identify some of those challenges. So I would really ask that you send those to our office. Let's talk after. Um, because we are looking for what are the regulations that are getting in the way of some of these activities and, and what can we do to fix them? And ultimately, we would bring them to our board to ask for their support in changing them. And, and Las Positas is leaning to um, two versions of English 1A with, a, with additional unit attached to a second ver to the, um, stu for the students that would need more help. And that's the very reason that co-requisite issue, they've been trying to work around that. Oh, great. Hi, um, I'm Pam Birdman with the Opportunity Institute. So one thing that's striking me in this conversation is a sort of a disconnect between what the data seem to very clearly show and what many faculty, um, the beliefs that many faculty bring to this work. And I think that those are um, well-meaning uh, based in their past experience, but they don't see them ref necessarily reflected in the data. Um, I've been looking at even K-12 tracking, for example. The data is really clear that tracking isn't good for students. But a lot of teachers, it's like they don't, part of it is capacity, don't know how to teach to a class with mixed ability, as Katie was alluding. Mm -hmm. So I would just be curious if any of you, especially Katie, can comment on what are the strategies that can help, um, you know, there may be people who are just resi completely resistant, but putting that aside, 
can help bridge those differences between what the research is saying and, and what faculty are bringing and you know wanting their students to succeed. So how, how do you bring, bring the, that closer? I mean, one of the things we, we do when we give workshops for faculty is we, we share a range of data, not just quantitative graphs, but student stories with faces to them and samples of the classroom activities so that the, the where, where faculty live and breathe is with their students in the classroom. And so if you can say, here's literally what we do in the English co-requisite class, or here's literally what we do in the stats with support, here's how we layer in the, the foundational skills that they should have maybe, they didn't remember from when they had it in seventh grade, but we're still teaching the higher level when we do that you can really bring a lot of faculty to say, oh, okay, I, I was skeptical that this couldn't work. I, I believe that this was maybe gonna lead to a dumbing down, but now I can see this is rigorous and I can see, and, I, and they start to believe it in a way that is different than if they just had the graphs. Um, so that's a piece of it and we do that all the time and we've been doing that for 10 years. But the thing I would also say is, at a certain point, about a year and a half or two years ago, I just was in, we had been working so hard at a grassroots faculty mobilization effort trying to recruit the volunteers to do this. And we reached less than 10% of the students in the state because we had faculty who literally would say to us, they would hear the whole, all the data, and that it is unambiguous that these reforms are better for students. It is unambiguous. And they would just say things like, hmm, we're not going to do that until somebody makes us. Like literally, with like multiple colleges, we're not doing that until somebody makes us. And I sort of thought, like, oh, that seems to be the next phase of this work. <laughs> and we, somebody's going to need to make us do this in order to, you know, often people talk about what's going on in their department and their colleagues and and how they're, you know, they're going to, you know, this sort of like refusal to engage with what the data say. And I just, in my mind, I just say, hashtag why we needed AB705. Hashtag, like, I, I, throughout my day, I'm talking to faculty, hashtag why we needed AB705. That there was just a point where it was like, we were never going to get, past, if we only were doing this on a voluntary basis, we weren't going to get system level change. One thing is clear, though, I do want to mention as well, and that is that not everyone is going to be where they need to be by next fall, right? So there's going to be lots of folks that aren't. So that means that they will have made incremental steps. So get researchers involved in those incremental steps, and they will see for themselves. And I think that's influential, right? It's your campus. It's our campuses. It's our students. So let's see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it seems important. Yes, hi. Um, I'm going back to the professional development topic. Professors have a lot of autonomy. So how do you ensure that these professors are taking the professional development and that you're ensuring that those teachers that are taking the development are the ones teaching this course? Because if you don't have the teacher that's willing to change and willing to update their t teaching methodology, all of our work is for naught. Mm. Now, I just want to speak to that. So the state, in, in states that have made, they're, they're centralized states, unlike local control California, they're, they're just, they're, they're, the governing board is like, we're doing this, we're not doing that anymore, that doesn't work. So in the states where they forced top-down change to co-requisite remediation, they did not get every teacher to teach better. And they did not get everybody to believe in the capacity of their students and let go of their deficit frame or all, all the things that we want to happen so that students have the best classroom experience that they have. People continued to be the teachers they were, but because they changed the structure for students, like in Tennessee, four times higher completion of transfer level math across the state. And if you look at Colorado, West Virginia, Georgia, it's incredibly consistent. The results are shifting from literally just going from pre-rec remediation to co-rec remediation produces these great gains across whole states, even without the kinds of, I, I think that what, when we're talking about changes to teaching, then we can get even better results. But just the structural change alone will produce, we've seen in, in multiple states, massive gains in completion. So it is not for naught. The first step is the structural change, and then the much harder step is the, the pedagogical change and the, and the faculty hearts and minds and what we believe about students. Do we believe the students are capable, or do we look at the data from Tennessee and say, well, clearly they've all just dumbed down the curriculum. Like, why, why do we believe that before we believe Oh, the students are capable. <laughs> like, there's two explanations for the gain. The students were more capable than we gave them credit for, or every faculty member in the state has no integrity and has dumbed down the curriculum. We want to believe this. Um, I 
As a reading specialist and someone who taught at the community college for 30 years, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, um, how do you guarantee that the curriculum is not dumbed down, number one? And number two, reading is often a very forgotten skill in these, in, in even English 1A classes. So how are, how are people going to, um, not guarantee, but be inclusive in um, providing for students to increase their reading ability and not just their writing ability? Um, it, in regards to the, um, the work that we did in English and opening access, um, the first when we got our first data back, and we, we have a town meeting where everyone comes once a month, and when they presented the data and they showed the students that what the history has been and then what is the success of the students now that we've opened access. And if it had been a cartoon, all the character, the chairs would have creaked and all the characters would have just like sat forward all at the same time, you know, because everyone was so like, oh, what is this going to show us? And to see the success not drop, same instructors, and they were all there in the room, same instructors doing the same. It, it was so heartening. It was so heartening to see that, um, that we were serving more students more quickly in a better, in a better way. Um, so I, I just want to give that as, a, as an example of what, of what can be. In terms of um, the, the reading aspect, the question that you're really asking is, how do we not forget reading? It, the, the work we do on reading, how to read a book, how to look at a passage, how, those kinds of things. But I think that question is actually maybe being asked all across the state as we see reading programs changing and being absorbed into English. And you know, just that question has been being looked at for quite a number of years. And people are approaching it differently. Some still have reading departments and some, yeah. and some don't. I would say that the professional development that shows inside the classroom and how do you attend to the reading and the writing in an integrated fashion, that helps a lot. You know, mm -hmm. where, where people, who, I used to think I had like a non-dominant limb, you know, or as like I was, I had called myself a writing teacher for 10 years and then I really beefed, strengthened the other limb around reading and wow, my papers got so much better. So I, I sort of share that and then share, we share curricular materials and instructional cycles and to, strategies in the classroom. So. Um, and then I think there's another question under your question, which is um, faculty, the issue of faculty departmental control, and that we have had separate reading faculty who have been teaching classes that now students can't be placed into. And so where are they going to go? What are they going to do? <laughs> and and I, my position on that, that's a political issue, that, that, is that I think that we need to make sure that our English composition classes can be taught by people who have a reading background or a writing background, and that we acknowledge the strengths that both groups of faculty bring to the table, and that we recognize that both have a non-dominant limb that needs to be strengthened through professional development. So I, I think it's a very simple solution is to sort of take the course outline for college comp and make it English or reading min quals. Um, that's a political issue, and some English departments don't want their reading colleague. And there's a sort of a like, I don't know, I, I'm not on that side. I won't fight that fight. I think everybody has something to bring to the table, and we're not looking to get rid of human beings. We want our people to contribute, but we don't want to protect structures that are not serving students because they serve a group of faculty. That's, that's where I come down. Looks like we have time for one more question today, or or no more if there's if we're all done. Just wait for the microphone there. Okay, thank you for letting me ask two questions. Um, my second. You're in a different question, seat. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it was a trick. Um, my. I, I was just wanted to ask on the math, math side, yeah. um, I know there's been discussion in the field and interest among some math faculty in um, a model that CSU is actually implementing, which is two semester stretch courses. And um, 
I've heard different interpretations of whether that approach flies or doesn't fly in the community college, you know, under the current guidance. So I was wondering if you have any clarification on that. I don't know much about that. Colleges should not be enrolling, requiring students to take below transfer level unless they meet the two requirements, that the student would be highly unlikely to succeed without it. Um, so I think that um, they, you know, there's an experimental period where colleges can try new things and see if they can come up with better results than the default rules provide. Uh, so I, I don't want to say no, but I think that, um, you know, there's a very clear limitations on what the statute directs colleges to be doing. So can I just clarify, they're talking about two semesters yeah. that are college level. Like a two semester sequence. Yeah that is college level as opposed to one semester. That, yeah, the, that's exactly, the question yeah. I keep hearing. Okay. So the, yeah. there's a prohibition um, or language in AB 705 that, talk, that prohibits colleges from extending a student's time to degree. So if they're requiring a course that should be three or three units to be seven units, then that would be counter to the requirements or two of two semesters. Yeah. Instead of one, you'd have to deny access to the one semester in order to put somebody into that two semester path. Right. The other thing just to keep in mind is, so our co-rec models in English, for example, had the 78% pass rate. This is what this report has found across the nine colleges offering them. What would it take for a two-course a two pathway to beat that number? Because that's what AB705 holds us to, is the students have to have the best possible chance of completion. So you'd have to, I, I have to say, you don't just beat the default rule, you have to beat co-rec results. So it's sort of like, so if 78% is the English number, in order to, for a two-course pathway, because a two-course pathway, you have to pass the first course, mm -hmm. persist into the next course, and then pass this next course, you'd have to have 90% of students pass the first course, 90% of students persist into the next course, and 90% pass that course within the one-year window, and still it would be 73%. And, and now that you're only talking about the lowest students, too, because you can't, you, you know, so if you take you the bottom, the 1.9 and below group, does that seem likely? You know, <laughs> does it seem likely that you're going to hit 90, 90, 90 and still not even be up at the co-rec result? So I sort of think, yes, there's this gray area of AB705. Could you, quote, unquote, innovate a new two-semester pathway? I guess there's, that's, the, that's where I would say like people are trying to go into the gray area and find the loopholes. I think the evidence is very clear that that, that pathway will never be a one semester co-rec. Well, uh, I do want to thank our, our panel today. You guys were excellent. I want to thank Marisol, who was also excellent. Uh, Deborah for the introductions, our sponsors. Uh, but mostly I want to thank you guys for attending uh, and sticking out even after your lunch break was over. Uh, I really appreciate that on a Friday. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to call it. Marisol will be up here. Uh, to answer questions, and she loves to talk about research, so uh, <laughs> you can use that. I can't speak for our panel, but Marisol will be here. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>